Thank you very much for attending. Um, we're going to, apologies for the late uh, start. Um, I think I was informed by Harley and the team that there was a, there was a bit of a uh, bit of a sort of malfunction with the software. The other thing I really want to apologize about is last time when I missed the webinar, so I'm really glad that we're able to do it and repeat it. What happened last time was I lost my dog, well, my sister's dog, and um, I, I, I was at last, last uh, uh, I was babysitting a dog and it ran away. Anyway, long story. Uh, you don't want to hear that. What you want to hear about is Achilles and plants are up. So let's get into it. Um, we're going to be uh, talking. Hopefully, there's going to be some time for questions at the end. So basically, a bit of background about myself. I work four days a week as a uh, tendon researcher at Monash University in Melbourne, and um, one day a week I'm at our clinic in Hawthorne in Melbourne. And these are just some photos of our clinic. Um, what we're going to cover today. So the brief I've been given by um, Heidi and everyone is to go over Achilles and plantar fascia, so hopefully we'll get a, a chance to cover those well. Um, we're going to go through a little bit of function, pathology and pain. We're going to move on to a little bit of uh, uh, diagnosis. We're going to go into a little bit about you know kinetic chain and movement um, and then we're going to talk about rehab and some adjuncts. Okay? Um, I can't see any questions because uh, I've minimised the panel on the side there. So. I'm happy for maybe Heidi or someone else to, to, to go through the questions later on um, if there are questions as we go along. Um, so one of the key principles for talking about tendons and the plantar fascia is no different. I uh, categorize the plantar fascia as a tendon like any other tendon. Um, it basically um, uh, it stores energy when, it, uh, when we're doing things that involve stretch, shorten, cycle. And stretch shorten cycle are things like walking, running, and jumping, uh, where tendons like the plantar fascia and the Achilles stretch um, and then recoil, and, they, and that's a very important mechanism uh, for saving energy um, and efficiency of locomotion. So what happens when it does that is that the muscle fascicles, as you can see here, um, are able to stay at an optimal length, and the tendon undergoes lots of stretch. Um, in the eccentric phase, so therefore the muscle fascicles work more efficiently because they're at a more optimal length. Uh, the other advantage is that there's lots of passive energy from the tendon, so the tendon um, uh, stores energy and then recoils, um, and that contributes to locomotion in a very passive way as well, both improving the efficiency of human movement. Um, so what is tendinopathy? What should we talk about? Uh, we're going to go through some tissue changes. We're going to talk about pain and some of the theories around pain, um, and we'll talk a little bit about dysfunction as well. Uh, so, what do we know about pathology in tendons? We know that one of the key things that happens is that you get lots of cells. So, uh, tendinopathy is a very metabolically active and cellular type of disease. Um, you also get um, you also get a change in cells, so you have more cartilage type cells. Uh, you have an increased amount of ground substance, so there's lots of. So, ground substance is basically proteins that bind water under high pressure, um, much like you find in cartilage. So, you have a lot of ground substance, and that causes the thickening of tendons. Um, so, it's nothing to do with inflammation, um, it's all about the ground substance, uh, the thickening that we see with tendons. Um, uh, the, the, the other thing that we see is a breakdown in the collagen matrix. So if you look at this ultrasound scan here, you've got nice normal tendon and then you've got a real dark bit of tendon there which is uh, most likely a broken down matrix and um, an area where the matrix has lost its, its, its well organized um, collagen um, uh, uh, fibrillar uh, uh, um, structure. Uh, so that's what we tend to we also, uh, we also uh, see a neurovascular ring growth into the tendon, um, and um, uh, so these are these are the hallmark features of tendon pathology, um, and we know there's possibly an order to how they happen. So we know that um, uh, some tendons uh, display only the ground substance accumulation, whereas when you get to later 
and more degenerate pathologies, you tend to have the broken down matrix. Um, and that's what the continuum model talks about, where you go from a uh, less pathological ground substance accumulation to more breakdown in the matrix. Now, one thing about the breakdown in the matrix is we know that once that occurs, there's no way back from that. So it's most likely irreversible. Um, and I would say that a majority of the tendons that we see clinically have got irreversible pathology where there's no way back. So the pathology is not a good outcome measure. And that's the reason I don't like the continuum model because um, for most patients, pathology is irreversible. Um, and secondly, we know the pathology phases in the continuum model don't correlate with pain. Um, so I prefer to focus on pain and dysfunction um, as we're going to in this lecture. One of the key concepts around uh, pathology is how do we get it? So what types of loads are bad for the tendon? Um, and we've got pretty clear evidence from the literature that high plus fast loads um, are the problem. So if you put someone in a dynamometer like this picture up here and you get them to maximally contract uh, their calf, uh, they will produce about 3.6 body weights of force through their Achilles tendon. Uh, their Achilles tendon will strain by 5% at a load rate of about 0.7 body weights per second. If you get someone to hop, uh, the forces are much higher in the Achilles tendon, so about 6 times body weight, and the strain is also much higher, so about 8.3 times body weight. The other important thing about cyclic Stretch, short, stretch shortened cycle loads like hopping and running and jumping um, is that the loading rate is much higher. So we define this stretch shortened cycle load and again it's things like walking, running and jumping as high plus fast load. Um, okay, so this is, this is high load. Uh, no one would dispute that 3.6 times body weight is high, uh, but this is high plus fast load. And we know that high, high plus fast load is the type of loading that tends to lead to injury. So we need to be careful about transitions and change in loading when we're talking about running, jumping, um, change direction and walking activities. The other type of load that's been related to tendon injury is compression. So we know that at the emphasis of the Achilles tendon and even for the plantar fascia up against the uh, medial tubercle of the calcaneum, there is um, a potential for compression in certain positions. Um, so for example, with the um, Achilles tendon, it's compressed against the calcaneum and dorsiflexion. Um, so compression is important, but it's not as important as high and fast load. So no one gets a tendinopathy just by stretching or just by compressing their tendon. Um, uh, even if um, um, I'm sure uh, people listening, uh, a lot of podiatrists, and you'd see a lot of plantar fascia, um, and there's you know, this sort of um, um, uh, uh, belief that plantar fascia patients can get it just from standing. Um, now that's, that's not really true because we know that you need to be doing some sort of high fast load which is walking, running or jumping. Um, the standing is sensitized when they have it, i.e. it's painful after the event of developing the tendon problem, uh, but they don't develop it unless they're doing this, which is the high and fast load. So that's the type of thing that we should be really asking them about and really monitoring um, in terms of progressions. The, the compression is just an additional, um, I guess you could say, icing on the cake in that it becomes painful. Stretching and provocative compressive positions become painful only after, after the time that they've got it. Uh, but it's not necessarily a cause for most people. So this is a simple model to explain pathology to patients. Basically there's a big black box here which is growth factors, cytokines, inflammatory factors and there are, there are hundreds of them that change in regulation when you have a tendon problem um, and that leads to both tissue changes and pain and dysfunction but we know and as we've talked about already that tissue changes do not really correlate well with pain and dysfunction. Um, so we don't really focus on the tissue changes as much. Um, we know there are lots of people with tissue changes that don't have pain um, and um, therefore the pain mechanisms uh, seem to be separate to simply just the tissue changes themselves. Um, so how do we explain pain and, and where is the, what's the pain related to? Um, 
it's not a classic inflammation. It's probably nociceptively driven. So it's probably there are lots of there there are lots of biochemicals that are in higher concentration in tendinopathic tendon um, that could potentially explain pain. So this is a sort of local nociceptive type pain. Um, and um, this is how we think about tendon pain these days. It's probably a local nociceptive component to it, uh, but we just don't know which factors are the most important ones out of the, you know, out of the many factors that are um, that are changed in their regulation. Um, so we we don't understand tendon pain, but um, it's believed that there is a local nociceptive driver, um, and there are many potential candidates for. for for relevant drivers. There are also central changes present, particularly in the upper limb, but some emerging evidence in the lower limb that there are central changes to pain regulation as well, uh, which is um, um, an important consideration. Uh, I don't think it changes our management much, as I will talk about um, as we go through. So this is probably the best study, the best recent study looking at central changes in Achilles tendinopathy. So it was a case control study. They looked at something called conditioned pain modulation. And what that is, is basically immersing um, an extremity, a hand or a foot in freezing cold water until the point of pain. And they measure things like pressure pain threshold before and after. And what is the normal response in someone that doesn't have pathology or pain is that they exhibit an increase in pressure pain threshold, so therefore they are less sensitive to pain following the painful stimulus. Um, people that have Achilles tendinopathy don't display that reduction in, oh sorry, that increase in pressure pain threshold. Um, they still are sensitive to um, pressure pain threshold uh, when after the painful stimulus. So therefore they have a reduction in central inhibitory pain mechanisms. Um, so, so this is good evidence that there is a change in central modulation or central, um, uh, that there's a central involvement in, in pain in people with Achilles tendinopathy. And the good thing about this study is it's the first one to to measure condition pain modulation. There are many now in the lower limb that measure um, pressure pain thresholds and qualitative sensation testing. Uh, but this um, method is arguably superior and has only been looked at in this one study. The other, so we've talked a little bit about uh, pain, a little bit about pathology, a little bit about the causes of, um, a little bit about the causes of um, uh, of uh, plantar fascia and Achilles, and that is load and high and fast load. Um, there are also many, many causes that are non-load related and systemic factors. Um, things like having a higher BMI or poorer metabolic health, um, a family history uh, of tendinopathy, menopause or amenorrhea, um, autoimmune issues, um, and uh, also things like diabetes, um, exposure to certain um, drugs like fluoroquinolone antibiotics. So these things are important things to look at in someone's history. And by and large, when we're seeing a lot of these things, we generally recommend simply um, getting someone fitter, so increasing their fitness and aerobic exercise um, as one of the key treatments um, to deal with a more systemic uh, presentation. The other key sort of area of, of risk factors that are associated are biomechanics. Uh, there was a recent systematic review uh, in plantar fascia, and I should have had a slide in here. I apologize for that, but I can forward the paper on. It was a systematic review of biomechanical factors in plantar fascia, and it featured in um, a tendinopathy blog that I do probably a few weeks ago. I think it was about two months ago. Uh, but what was interesting about that review is that they found factors like um, calf strength and um, ankle dorsiflexion, flexibility, foot posture were conflicting. So what that means is there wasn't clear evidence that they were or were not related to um, 
uh, plantar fascia, and some studies showed that increased dorsiflexion was related, whereas others showed that decreased dorsiflexion. So when you look at the biomechanical evidence, it really is a bit of a mess. There's no clear picture um, emerging, which suggests two things. One, um, they're not strong risk factors, um, and two, uh, we need to be focusing only on uh, these biomechanical factors when they're relatively major. Um, so one of the things I talk about when I do teaching courses is um, a concept called definitely unequivocal deficit. So looking at things like ankle, ankle dorsiflexion and uh, thinking about when it's relevant for the individual. Um, so moving on to some of the concepts around um, uh, diagnosis of tendinopathy. So how do we know if someone has an Achilles or a, or a plantar fascia? Um, the, the sort of diagnosis is based on subjective information mainly, so localised pain. They usually should have a clear load pain relationship. So what that is, is they should um, recall some sort of change in I've used the term energy storage there, but what that is synonymous with is high plus fast load. So they've had some change in high fast plus fast load. Now, if they've had a long history, so for example, two or three years, then they're probably not going to remember that. Um, so that's a hard one to ascertain sometimes. But when you see them, um, and that's not as clear, you can still look for what type of response they have to load. So we'll look at some load tests in a second, but they should have a um, they should have a consistent load pain relationship. Now, what that means is the more load you put through their tendon, the, the higher the pain is, and that's a good diagnostic sign. Um, they might flare up to um, usually for high and fast loads again. So when they go for a run or, or a longer walk, they tend to be worse the next day. So they have this, this sort of um, delayed uh, reaction to those types of high plus fast loads. Uh, but that's not necessarily the case. Some people, and that's people who are more sensitized, more painful, more irritable, will also flare up to loads that are, that are lower. So not necessarily high plus fast. So for example, um, you might give someone a calf raise as an exercise, and that's a that's a, that you could argue that's a not a high. It's definitely not a high plus fast load. It's a, it could be a high load, but it's a high plus slow load. Um, so it's definitely going to be lower load for the Achilles and plantar fascia, but they might still flare up to that. So that's that is atypical, but not altogether uncommon, and it again signifies that they're just more irritable. The other thing that you look for is they warm up after load, so they tend to have a warm up, so they might feel morning stiffness and then they warm up after a little bit of activity. Um, and that's particularly true in the Achilles and the plantar fascia, which we're talking about today. Um, so that's your first bit of information that you need for diagnosis, and that's all subjective information. Um, and the next thing um, that I'll tend to do to confirm a diagnosis is then test the load pain relationship. So you've asked them about it, but then you also test it. So you put them through a series of load tests and you try and see if they've got a consistent load pain relationship, i.e. the pain goes up as the load goes up. So this is an example of a sequence of loading tests, so two-legged calf raise, two-legged calf raise plus knee bent. Um, and then you, sorry, I haven't got it in there, but you progress to one-legged calf raise plus knee bent. Um, a submaximal hop, a faster hop, or hopping on their toes. Sometimes that can bring about um, more symptoms, and then you can progress to maximal hopping. Um, obviously, if you've got someone who's sedentary, you may not do these ones um, with a sedentary person. You may look at something like walking or fast walking instead. Um, but it's very helpful if you can reproduce their symptoms. What I would do for a sedentary person is actually go through the one-legged calf raise knee bend, but then add some weight to it, and then add some speed to it. So you're really trying to reproduce pain. Because um, as I say, that really helps you with the, with the diagnosis if you, can get a, if you can get a consistent load pain relationship. Just going to look at an example of uh, Achilles for diagnosis. Um, so obviously with your differential diagnosis, you've got, so so far you've worked up a subjective history that's consistent and you've done some load testing 
Um, the third thing is to exclude other potential sources. Um, and you would have done this partly from the subjective. Um, uh, so if we take the example of mid-portion Achilles uh, or Achilles tendon, um, things like paratenin, fat pad, plantaris are common associated uh, pathologies that will present slightly differently. So for example, when you've got a paratenin, they tend to have slightly more diffuse symptoms. They tend to have, they don't have a consistent load pain relationship. So if you do your load tests here, instead of reporting say a one out of 10 with two legged and then a you know two or three out of 10 with two legged knee bent, um, it will be just the same pain. So it's just the same regardless of what you do. So that's a common feature of paratenin. Um, they tend to have crepitus on examination, um, as I say, more diffuse symptoms. And they'll also have a shorter history um, most of the time. Um, fat pad, often more diffuse and deep to the tendon symptoms. And again, it's often associated. Plantaris, medial symptoms. So they'll tend to have uh, medial Achilles symptoms. Um, so you're looking at um, um, uh, that as the main diagnostic sign for a plantaris. The other thing to note about all these is that even though you pick them up with your clinical assessment, um, there's not really any change in the loading treatment. So the loading treatments are going to be exactly the same for all of these. Um, the actual exercise doesn't change. What may change is the additional adjunct therapies that you do. So for example, with a paratenin, um, what we uh, often do is get them to apply topical anti-inflammatory and we get them to wrap that in cling film and leave it for five nights. Well, they change it every night, obviously, but they, uh, they do that for five nights in a row. Um, so things like that are additional adjunct. But you may even go to anti-inflammatories more likely or you, you might go to something like an injection for something like plantaris if they're not resolving. So it's more about picking these additional sociodiagnoses up because then it might lead you down a different path at some point down the track if their loading is not working. But I would generally always try loading with all of these um, uh, before we, we progress to other interventions. Um, Cyril nerve, so lateral Achilles pain um, and some paresthesia, uh, rupture, partial rupture, um, obviously these ones are um, important to diagnose. I guess a, just a quick word about the partial rupture. Um, they are really, really uncommon. So I think they're partial rupture slash partial tear. Partial tears are really commonly diagnosed. If someone goes to a radiologist, they'll look at it and they'll diagnose a partial rupture or partial split. Um, most of the time it's just a typical degenerative tendinopathy that's been called a partial uh, a partial um, tear and it can cause issues because it, it it creates a negative impression of the tendon for the for the individual involved and causes lots of potential pain issues in the future so I think it's an important thing that we need to educate about um, patients about and that is the difference between a real partial tear or rupture which is very very easy to pick up because they're quite disabled when they have a real partial tear. And I'm talking about a tear of you know 30, 40% or more of the Achilles tendon, um, which you know if I see 50 or 60 Achilles per year, I might see one or two partial ruptures. So they're really uncommon. Um, accessory soleus is just a low soleus down the bottom here. Um, it comes, it inserts lower in, near the calcaneum and causes like a compartment syndrome issue and obviously soleus muscle tears and things like that. So that's just an example of how um, uh, some of these differential diagnoses can give you different symptoms. Uh, but the point to reiterate again is that a lot of the times you're going to be treating them with education, load, load management, as we'll talk about, the key, the three sort of pillars of tendinopathy management, they, they're not going to vary regardless of the differentials, but they, they, they may be important for later because you may then decide about some other additional adjuncts, either at the time or later on. Um, 
So when is it appropriate or necessary to image someone? Um, say you're suspecting some of these differentials, you may go down the path of imaging, but again I wouldn't do that until four to six weeks down the track uh, when and if the loading hasn't uh, led to the results that you're after. Um, uh, suspected tear or rupture is another time uh, to look at imaging. Obviously red flags. Um, um, I don't really subscribe to the reactive degenerative model, continuum model, because I don't think, as I say, the pathology doesn't marry with pain, so not necessary. Um, one of the things I use imaging for a lot, so I ultrasound image every patient um, from the knee down, so patellar, Achilles, tibialis, posterior and plantar fascia. And the main reason I use it for is reassurance because most patients have come away from the radiologist or the doctor with really negative impression of their tendon and that is that they've got this tear or partial split or whatever it is um, and that's the source of all their problems. Um, for what we know is that that's probably not related to any of their problems and um, also there's nothing they can do about it. So, uh, so what we, um, uh, what what I tell them is that uh, this is a small part of the of a bigger picture, and really the rest of their tendon or a, the vast majority of their tendon is viable and very healthy. So, trying to put a positive spin on pathology, um, and if you can do that with your own ultrasound machine, it really can be quite powerful for people. Um, all right, so moving on to some of the assessment type um, uh, bits. So we've got uh, this concept that we call load tolerance. So we defined it in a patella tendon narrative review last year. And um, basically it's, um, it guides all the management of a tendon patient, whether it's plantar fascia, Achilles or whatever tendon. Um, so you want people generally to have acceptable pain during an activity, so that could be their rehab or walking, or whatever they're doing, and not to have a very strong reaction to that activity after. So their pain should settle shortly after that loading session, whatever it is. Um, so you may use some guides like 3 out of 10 or less, but it doesn't really work for everyone. It's just a guide um, or 24-hour response as well. I'm not so tied to the 24-hour response, what I usually tell my patients is the, the next loading session. So if you give them rehab to do every second day, um, they should be recovered by the next loading session. If you give them walking to do, they should be recovered by the next loading session. So the next time that they're doing that activity, um, they shouldn't be any worse than the previous time they did it. So patients can understand that it's an easy thing, it's an easy instruction for them to go away and, and, um, and implement. Um, so how do we assess load tolerance? So we assess it based on subjective factors, so monitor things like morning stiffness daily or between loading sessions. Um, and the other one, as we've talked about already, is the load test. So you're doing all your load tests as we talked about, hopping and calf raises, and you monitor that between loading sessions. So my instruction to patients is keep an eye on these between your loading sessions. And if they're tracking upwards, then we're we're sort of entering into territory that we don't want to. We've got to regress the load or modify the load a bit. Um, um, and the other thing that we've talked about is what are they flaring to? Is it high plus fast load or is it just the just even slow loads that are flaring them? And you know that's not really a diagnostic um, difference, but it does tell you that they're more irritable if they're flaring to lower loads. Um, some people talk about um, central sensitization and you know maybe that maybe people that have got you know flaring to these lower loads are more centrally sensitized or spreading pain um, they're more centrally sensitized but I don't think we have a lot of evidence to support that um, I think the easiest way as we've talked about to do it is to um, is to exclude other diagnoses and if you've done that, then you're pretty confident you've got a tendon um, and if they're flaring to lower loads or they've got a bit of spreading pain, that's okay. It's still a tendon, it's still an Achilles, it's still a, a plantar fascia, but it's just having a manifestation that is slightly different um, to the normal. Um, so these are the load intolerant presentations that I tend to look out for. So um, you've got people who have got 
they were mildly load intolerant, and they flare predictably to high plus fast load. So these are the these are the ones that you would expect. They flare to things that you would expect. So you put a bit of high plus fast load, and they flare. Um, so I've just got some examples there. So Jeremy, Jeremy, elite tennis player, six months of patella tendon pain. Um, uh, 4 out of 10 on the single leg decline squat, 2 out of 10 on the hop, he flares for 1 or 2 days after tennis loads. Um, and then you've got people who've got, who are severely load intolerant, they flare massively to any load. So they're often deconditioned, so this is someone who might have had it for a few years, whatever load you put in their system they flare you know, a lot. So for example, Shaden, um, who was out of football for 3 years, again with a patel tendon, was flaring for a week after I gave him leg extension as a rehab. Um, so obviously the wrong exercise to give him. But um, uh, what I learned from that is that he was a severely load intolerant person, flaring massively to any load. And then you've got people who are severely load intolerant because they're going through a flare up. They've got high load with any with anything, sorry, high pain with any with anything you do. So plantar fascia you often see in this presentation, even Achilles. So they'll come into your rooms and you'll do calf raise and you'll do maybe a hop test and they're scoring 8 or 9 out of 10 um, and things like that with, with those types of load activities. Often they have a short, cha a recent change in their load that's caused that sensitization. Or they might just be on this high, real sensitized, um, um, you know, uh, presentation for a long time um, if their current activity is enough to maintain that sensitization. Um, so some people they're doing enough walking or whatever it is for them to maintain that sensitization. So there are three load intolerant groups that you tend to look for. Um, the ones that flare easily, the ones that are in that high pain with any load and the ones that are flaring predictably. Okay, so we've covered that. Um, so let's go into um, let's go into the three key treatments. So education, load management, as well as rehab. So they're the three what I call three pillars of um, of tendon management. So you want to get those three things right, and then everything else is an adjunct and additional thing. Um, so in terms of education, we know pain. And we've talked about this central sensitization, peripheral sensitization. There's evidence for both. Um, there could be a combination of both for, for these tendons that we're seeing. Um, we know also that pain is modulated by past experiences, knowledge, beliefs, many other factors. Um, so how do we explain this and convey this to patients? Uh, the, the simplest way that I've found and what I do these days is just tell patients that they have a threshold issue. So. Um, what you want to try and separate in their mind is uh, pain from damage. So they've got an issue with threshold, they're more sensitive to pain, their tissue is sensitized, or you could even say their nervous system is sensitized, it could be central or peripheral. Um, but it's not about tissue damage or tearing, it's about sensitization. And I think that's a good message to get through to them. And then the whole, the whole rehab or the whole treatment becomes about trying to increase their threshold. And um, what you tell them is that the only way to do that is to, is to load them to try and increase and restore their threshold. So that's a really easy way to explain pain. The other thing that you want to do is load manage them if necessary. So if they're in those load intolerant groups that we talked about, they're flaring um, to load or they're just very high in their uh, pain presentation all the time, uh, the most important thing to do is take them off the high plus fast loads. So things like the walking and the running, so you want to reduce that um, in the short term. Um, until they become low tolerance. Okay, so an example could be a runner who presents and is running five days a week, um, and they're they're always in high pain. Uh, you might reduce them to running twice a week, or you might take the running away completely. And that decision is based on how sensitized and how irritable they are. Um, and it's never an easy one. I think it's always trial and error. But you're trying to minimize the amount that you're taking away. And we'll talk about the reason why that's important in a second. The other thing you might do is reduce sensitized 
movement. So if they are painful with things like hopping, you might, sorry, not hopping with uh, things like stretching, um, you might take that away for a short amount of time. But I, I generally tell them it's okay to stretch, it's okay to do yoga if it's not painful because again it's not going to cause their tendon problem, it's going to be painful when the tendon is sensitized. The reason it's really important to not load manage them too much, i.e. to maintain the running and the walking as much as possible, is because there's evidence from this study from Silvernagel that if you take away their running, they tend to lose their power. So what they did in this study is they randomized Achilles patients into two groups and they tracked them over a year. They gave them both identical rehab. The only difference was one had active rest, which was stopping their running for the first six weeks. And in that group at 12 months, they had inferior power. So their power was still not recovered from stopping running for six weeks. So very important to actually try and maintain their running and their walking activity as much as possible. Having said that, you do have to take it away for some people. Um, if it is proving to be difficult to, to, um, to get them into load, a load managed state. And the third critical thing to add into the mix is progressive loading. So this is the third um, sort of, um, I guess you could say, essential thing that I would look to do with most patients. So you're starting off with slow load, that tends to be better tolerated, progressing back to the energy storage or the high fast loads. Um, and it's all based on load tolerance. So I don't have any criteria based on strength. So for example, for an Achilles patient, um, I wouldn't say you need to do 15 or 20 calf raises before you can run. Um, the time they start running is all based on load tolerance and their load tests. So for example, uh, my criterion for running is they can hop five times with less than two or three out of 10 pain. When they can do that, they can start running. Um, gradually, um, regardless of how much strength they have. Um, you may start with some isometric loading and the indications to do that are uh, either if, they, if there's nothing else they can do that they're load tolerant to, so they can't do isotonic, um, i.e. going through range because it's too painful, you start with isometric or otherwise some people get a really good pain response to isometric so they do it, they feel much much better and then you can progress on and do other things like isotonic and in that case it's, it's also an indication um, to do the uh, is isometric but for most, most of our patients they just get isotonic because they're able to do that and the isometrics is something we do as an early intervention for some people. The key is to progressively take them towards their energy storage, which we'll talk about. Um, so there's a couple of studies on isometrics that I just want to bring your attention to. Um, this was the Ebony Rio study where they found a dramatic decrease in patella tendon post isometrics, decrease in pain with the squat after they did isometrics on the leg extension. Um, so this was a really interesting study in that they found a consistent decrease. Most people got a benefit to it. Um, Seth O'Neill recently tried to repeat the same protocol, so 70, so they pushed pretty heavy, 45 seconds by 5 at 70% of maximal contraction effort and he tried to repeat that for the Achilles in this seated position and what he found is that some subjects pain actually got worse rather than better. Um, others got better, so there was a real varied response. It's unclear why this is, and I think it's probably related to how sensitized someone is. So the more painful they are when they're doing it, probably the, 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 um, the worst response they're going to get. So isometrics are certainly not a panacea, but as I say, they're worth trying because some people do respond well to them. So let's look at just some tips about um, what exercise you can give these patients. Um, I really like the seated calf raise for Achilles and patella. So here's a guy here doing a seated calf raise. Uh, we do it in the Smith machine, but you can also do it in a um, calf raise machine. And they're just lifting up in a mid-range position. So he would lift his heel up and hold it for 30 seconds by five, two to three times per day, up to 70% MVC. Now, I don't really measure this, but I just get them to, to, hold, to push as, or hold as much weight as they possibly can for that 30 seconds. Now the difficulty with this is unless someone's very weak, 
they're going to get beyond their body weight pretty soon um, and therefore they're going to need a gym. So this that's the limiting factor with that exercise. Um, the other way that we sometimes do it is with a, with a leg press calf hold, so isometric holding in a leg press. Um, and again, this requires a gym. The alternative is a soleus wall sit. Um, so thanks to Tom Boom for that image. Uh, the soleus wall sit is a really good option for home and you can start to load them by holding weight. Um, so 30 seconds by five, one or two minutes rest between sets. Um, and the same for Achilles and plantar fascia, so no different. This is excellent, excellent rehab for pain. People tend to get real good response if they're in high pain. So for those really load intolerant groups, this is all I give them initially, one of these ones, whichever one works the best for them. Um, this is just some examples of how patients in Australia do their seated calf raise. So, and because one of the criticisms you get with a seated calf raise is it's not practical for home. Um, here's a person collecting sand at the beach. Here's someone with their rucksack and 30 kilos in each rucksack. Here's a girl doing it at the gym. Um, here's a person with their neighbour in there and a sandbag. And this guy here has made a calf raise machine out of an old sewing machine. So there are definitely ways of doing the city calf raise at home. Uh, but I would recommend a gym if you're getting above 70 to 80 kilos. Hard to do it at home. With, with more than that. Um, moving on from the isometric, if you don't need to give them isometric, and you don't for a lot of patients, um, just give them isotonic. So they're slowly going up and down, um, and I give them two of these. I pick two of these exercises, no more than two, and usually it's the seated calf raise or the leg press and the standing calf raise. So that's usually the protocol that I use. So one of these two and this one. Once they can do three sets of 15 in standing, they then do it with weight in a Smith machine or hold it with a rucksack at home. So you can do this one and this one. So the sitter calf and the standing calf at home with your elderly sedentary patients. And all they do is do this one with, with sandbags and this one um, with a rucksack or not, no weight. But for your athletic patients, your runners and footballers, you need to do this or this with heavy load and then progress to this with heavy load as well. Um, so that's a real basic but effective program. Um, with your Achilles insertional, the rehab is exactly the same, so it doesn't change. The only difference with the insertional is that you're very careful when you're going into dorsiflexion. So you might still do a bit of over the step stuff, but you may modify and not go to fully end, end of range. Um, that's the only difference that we do for these people. Um, and you can see just a, this is a guy, this is actually a basketballer who's got, um, it's a plantar fascia, and we get him with a rolled up towel under his toe, just like the Michael Rathliff study. Uh, because he needs to then have um, uh, a little bit more load on the plantar fascia when he's doing it that way. In terms of the evidence for rehab, aside from isometrics, which we've mentioned, um, there is uh, what the evidence is showing is that the, there's no there's no clear favourite exercise protocol. So if you look at things like the Alfredson protocol, which is very popular, uh, versus things like heavy slow resistance, which some people may have heard of from the Michael Rathliff and um, Kongsgaard and Bayer studies, uh, there's no difference between the Alfredson and the heavy slow resistance studies. And in fact, Michael Rathliff showed that there's no difference between doing something like heavy slow resistance, which is basically what this is, and um, and even stretching in the long term. So he did find benefit for heavy slow resistance at three months, but not in the long term. So what it tells us clearly in the literature is that any progressive loading is probably going to lead to benefit in terms of pain in the long term. Uh, but what I believe is that if you're doing heavy slow resistance, you're probably getting better benefits on the muscle adaptation, um, which may not be necessary for improving symptoms, but in the long term, they're probably going to be more functional and they may be less likely to have a recurrence as well. And that's why I favour this type of heavy slow resistance training. Um, and as I say, you can modify it 
very much so for patients who are sedentary. So all they do is this with 30 or 40 or 50 kilo sandbags on their knee and they just do this with, without any weight. So it's, it's really easy to modify um, for some groups. So just to finish off on, we'll talk a little bit about then progressing back to running if you've got your running patient. Obviously if you've got a walker, you just uh, what we usually do is find what their baseline of walking is and that's often based on a Fitbit or you know Fitbit or is better than self-report um, and um, then work, work their walking up from their baseline. Um, if you've got a runner, we give them this um, hopping program. So they generally do hopping once a week and running twice a week. Uh, and it's what we call a variable hop program which just gives a bit of motor variability. So they do double leg, single leg hops, they do single leg hops with a stiff knee, they do forward back side side hops and they do box hops and they then slowly increase the speed with all those. So they bring that in gradually over a number of weeks and they're doing it once a week. Um, on the other two days, we give them just gradual running again from their baseline. Um, so uh, we find this is a good way to do it for runners because often runners don't recover their power and the Silbernagel study that we saw is an example of that. They don't get their power back so this is a way the variable hop program is designed to give them that motor capacity back again. Um, and if we contrast that to a footballer, so say you've got a footballer um, again, you can keep it very simple. So you do something like a variable hop program um, as an initial uh, as an initial lead-in, and then we give them run-throughs. So 30 meters, eight by two, um, as an example, with a 200 meter jog recovery. The important thing is to progress their intensity of high-speed running back to maximal. Um, that's really, really important. Um, and then they might be doing things like cutting. Um, 90 degrees running forwards and backwards six times two. So that's um, um, the other key competency that they need is cutting. So we'd add the cutting in and once they can do a bit of this and they're pr relatively proficient at it, they've progressed their intensity, they can then start to bring in training drills. Um, so that's, that's an example of what you'd be looking at for, an, for a footballer. And there's no formula, but the best, the most important thing is to look at what do they need. And for an Achilles, they need to run fast, and they need to be able to cut and change direction and run backwards. And once they have those competencies, then they can start to progress back to training. Um, and as I say, the important thing is to rate somehow their intensity, because often what happens is the intensity of that end stage rehab is not at the level that it needs to be. Just a quick, quick slide on rupture. Um, uh, rupture rehab is often not done very well and often they end up with still deficits in things like their, um, they end up with continued deficits in their um, in their calf phrase function or unable to do a calf phrase. I often see them six months down the track when they're still not able to do a calf phrase um, and we give them lots of non-weight bearing, non-weight bearing Partial, sorry, partial weight bearing seated, seated and leg press. So they do lots of this and they do lots of this. And um, the advantage of this type of stuff is that they can load progressively to their body weight so that they can develop the strength they need in standing to do a calf raise. Um, so that, although it takes three to six months, it's a really surefire way to get their single leg calf strength back to where it needs to be. Um, so in terms of adjuncts, um, obviously there's lots of things that we can add in, but I guess the key message with adjuncts is that they are adjuncts and they're things that we shouldn't think about as um, the primary intervention for people. The education, progressive loading and load management uh, would probably get most people better alone um, if given time. Time is probably the um, the, the key factor and a lot of people don't have a lot of time so they then look at other adjuncts which is I think very justifiable but we need to just be sure that we're using them as adjuncts is not the main treatment. So often I see patients who have only had acupuncture for an Achilles tendon and not had any other treatment uh, which I don't think is a good idea um, or for example only had shockwave. But used in combination with all the other things these can be quite effective and, and improve 
pain and function in the short term. So I use orthotics as a way of modulating pain um, as well as augmented load eye tape or heel wedges. And the way that I would use these interventions is just to try them pre and post the load tests and see what effect they have. Um, so not so much for a biomechanical model, although you can use biomechanics as a guide for the patients that you'd select, but more so as a pain modulator. Um, ESWT, so shockwave, again improving pain in the short term. Um, uh, night splints I don't use anymore because they're just not very well tolerated. Um, acupuncture and dry needling I don't do myself, but again it's a short term way of improving symptoms. Um, anti-inflammatories and anti-inflammatories I would generally give everyone a one or two week course of anti-inflammatories if they're load intolerant. Um, steroid try and avoid um, and PRP also try and avoid um, because we know that it's um, for most people uh, very hit and miss and there's also good evidence that it doesn't it doesn't work when you compare it to placebo. Talk about ESWT a little bit more. Um, there's uh, not very good evidence that it is any different to placebo. If you really examine the evidence well, there are good quality studies that show it's no different to placebo. I believe there's probably more to it because it probably has a, a pain modulating effect because of the fact that it's so painful. Um, like the condition pain modulation, painful stimulus that we talked about earlier. Um, so I'm happy to try it with most tendon patients in the short term, see if they have a good response. If they do, then I would continue. If they don't, after one or two sessions, then we generally stop. And we're happy also to use it even just before they train or play as a way of modulating pain. Um, just a quick word about medications then, so anti-inflammatory short term pain response no problem. Um, steroid the problem is obviously ruptures and then relapse in the long term so we need to be very careful about that. So we don't tend to recommend steroid at all. Prednisolone um, is a potential alternative but there are risks with that as well. So for example um, a vascular necrosis of the femoral head. Um, high volume injection is good alternative for pain but the problem is there's not much evidence aside from case series. But still, I think um, if you remove the steroid, it's probably the best out of the, out of the lot. Um, with these injections, PRP, sclerosing, prolotherapy, and stem cells, not really something I'd recommend because we know that they really are working on a flawed healing model, i.e. the doctors will say you're going to get lots of healing, but we know that actually there's no healing that happens with any of them that anyone has been able to document from, with a good study uh, to date. Alright, so I think I will leave it there um, and um, open up for questions, but uh, yeah, I hope there's been something in there that's useful. This is my email, um, tendinopathy blog and also Twitter handle if anyone wants more information, but um, yeah, thanks a lot. Hi Peter, can you hear me? It's Heidi. Hi there, how are you doing? Hi, yeah great thanks, that was really really interesting, thank you. Um, some great. excellent uh, tips there I think, especially for diagnosing and I really great. like the, um, the threshold issue to, to say to patients. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> oh, excuse me, I'm coughing. I've got a few questions which have come up, so shall I read them out? Absolutely, yeah, go for it, go for it. Uh, oh, I can't get the questions up now. <laughs> Uh, no, a few. <coughs> oh, excuse me, I've got a frog in my throat. No, That's somebody nice. asked why you refer to the plantar fascia as a tendon. Yeah, well, the reason is um, it's a good question. The reason is it acts like a tendon. So if you look at ligaments, they don't undergo much strain or as much strain as tendons, um, whereas the plantar fascia it undergoes a large amount of strain and it has this stretch recoil function. The only, lig the only other ligament that's similar, you could liken it to the um, patella tendon and then you could liken the, um, so the patella is called a tendon but it goes between two bones like the plantar fascia does. 
um, there's no real difference between them if you think about the calcaneum as a sesamoid bone. So the calcaneum could be a sesamoid bone between the calf muscle and the plantar fascia. And then you've got this continuous structure of tendon that just absorbs energy. So the reason, the reason is that it basically acts like a tendon in terms of energy storage. Excellent, thank you. And another question has just popped up um, to say you talked a lot about the treatment for the Achilles tendon and do you have anything more specific that you would do for the plantar fascia? Well, it's exactly the same. There's no, there's no difference. Um, so my, my, our loading protocol for the plantar fascia um, is nothing about stretching, so we don't do any stretching. Um, we do um, we do exactly the same seated calf raise for plantar fascia. We'll start them all with that. The only difference is they'll they'll have the toe up um, with a rolled up towel, and we'll do the standing calf raise as well with them. So it's exactly the same, and they respond really really well. So really well to that sort of you know loaded stuff, and we tend to see ones that have you know had it for a long time and just not responding. Um, and our, my strong belief is that progressive loading and heavy loading is really important for these people. Now, the, obviously, the debate is about stretching. So, do you do you add stretching in? And what I tend to tell people is, there's no problem with stretching. You can add stretching in as well. Um, that's an additional thing you can do. Perhaps you don't need to, um, and I wouldn't recommend it. But not not because it's bad, but because I don't think you need to add the stretching in. I think you can just do the strength the strength work, and you will get the same benefit. Now you could probably just argue that you could do the stretching, you get the same benefit. But the reason I like the heavy slow resistance stuff that we do with the seated calf and the and the standing calf is that um, at least you're also going to guarantee you get strength gains, whereas you're not going to guarantee that with stretching. With stretching you get flexibility, but you may not get strength gains. And for some people, the strength gains might be critical as well. Yeah, I mean, I think you've raised some really important points there. And I know I'm certainly guilty of sort of automatically, or certainly in the past, thinking, well, I've got to do stretching and we've got to look at orthoses for, um, you know, any biomechanical factors in there. And I think, certainly mm. as podiatrists, some of us are guilty of not looking at the loading, possibly, mm. um, as early mm. as we should. Well, the good thing is, the good thing is, Heidi, it's really simple. Um, all you need to do is just do your, you know, it's really simple to do the um, the stuff that we do is so simple. Um, it's embarrassingly simple, but it works. <laughs> I think sometimes we look for things that are too hard, don't we? Um, mm. Right, somebody else has put a question in here. Where are mm. we? Uh, mm -hmm. Okay, what would you recommend to manage a patient who does not respond to low loads um, and who flares up easily? Um, the only thing you can do with someone like that, we tend to go um, um, down the path of the more sort of um, really stringent load management. So find it, if you're able to load management, so assuming they're not an in-season athlete, go down the path of um, really making sure that you're taking away all the loads that could potentially be maintaining their symptoms. Sometimes it, they're really, really sensitized, and it's not about that. And you just need to then um, give them. Sometimes we just go for medication options, so longer or stronger anti-inflammatories. Um, so, would you know, if the initial anti-inflammatories are not working, then go down the path of prednisolone for a week, um, something to give them a break from their pain. So, I think, um, yeah, I think, I, I think trying to um, uh, trying to look at medications as well as um, uh, as well as um, you know, load management would be the key things. Um, but then you can also throw in all the adjuncts that we talked about. So that's when you might be looking at you know orthotics and taping and you know dry needling as as adjuncts as well as everything else. Yeah. So again, I guess there we're addressing their uh, their threshold issue, aren't we? Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. That's 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 the key. That's the underlying key. Definitely. Right, Definitely. another question here said, often runners um, have tight hamstrings and calves. Uh, do you not recommend mm -hmm. lengthening um, shortened tissue prior to loading the foot? 
And then she's gone on to ask another question, why would the plantar fascia mm -hmm. go if there was no problem higher up the chain? Um, look, I, I, I think um, you can argue that. You can argue that. And I, I, I do a kinetic chain assessment with every patient. Um, so I'd look at kinetic chain key factors, and that would include flexibility. But I guess the point that I would make is that often biomechanically, where's your, where's your cutoff point and how do we know whether something is relevant is the, is the hardest thing. And I think what we do, and particularly physios are guilty of this, I don't know about podiatrists, but physios are guilty of this, we definitely focus on biomechanical factors way, way, way too much um, and we, well. we could lost, <laughs> get lost in the detail of biomechanics when for a lot of patients it can be a lot, lot simpler. And um, we, you've got to then step back and say where is the cutoff point and where, when am I convinced that this is a, a deficit that is definitely related to this person's presentation and when is it not? Or when are we just seeking patterns, i.e. seeking the patterns that we know and we, and, and we identify with. So that's the key thing. And I think you've got to be critical and sort of step back and say, you know, how do, how do I know this is relevant? And it's a really hard thing because I think I'm, you know, I'm guilty of it as well because you've got this biomechanical training and thinking and it doesn't always fit in. I think what I'm learning the more I sort of specialise in tendons is it often doesn't fit in. So often it just, you know, often, often biomechanical paradigm. So what I talk about when I do teaching and with the courses and stuff is, You've got a biomechanical paradigm, then you've got then you've got a load management paradigm, and you can use any one depending on the individual. So for a lot of patients, for all the patients, you would do load management paradigm, but not for all of them you would do biomechanics because it's not always relevant. No, and I think the key point there really is keeping it simple, isn't it? And in fact, it's funny. I was talking to a physio who I worked mm. who I've worked with for quite a long time, and he's been qualified for probably over 40 years now, and a whole wealth of knowledge. And we were talking mm. about the biomechanics mm. with actually it was a patient who had lower back pain, and he just said, mm. you know, if you look at the biomechanics, if you look deeply and closely enough and for long enough, you will always find a problem. But is that problem of always course. relevant to what they've come in with? So absolutely, absolutely, it's it's the confirmation bias, and I think all all clinicians are guilty of confirmation. Bias. You know, me included. We look for patterns and we look for things. We look for things that we know, and we, we suffer from confirmation bias badly. But um, you know, you, I think you've got to then be critical at a certain point and say, right, okay, so how do I know this is relevant? And if you can always ask yourself that question, and you know, and everyone's got their own models and their own way of thinking, and that's fine as long as you can then step back and say, how how sure am I that this is relevant for this person? I think is, is, is a good way of thinking. Yeah, definitely. So we've still got quite a few people uh, logged in. Is there any more questions that you want to ask Peter while we've still got him? I expect you. What's the time over there, Peter? It's getting on, isn't it? Time is uh, quarter past ten, but it's fine. At, it's at no night, problem. So you'll... Yeah, it's no, it's, it's, that's no problem. I'm just glad we got a chance to do it, Heidi, after the um, after the uh, <laughs> debacle, debacle last time. I didn't tell anyone that your dog had run off. I just said you had a family crisis. So. Uh... Yeah. Well, that was yeah, that was it was quite serious for me because the backstory to that is that my uh, sister had two dogs. One died like two weeks before, oh, and then nice. she. Um, yeah, she trusted me with uh, with her second dog, and um, it ran off the first night that I was that I was minding it, and it was I, I, it was away from uh, seven o'clock until about twelve o'clock at, at I midnight. Say, it, was a, it was a long time before you found her again, mm. wasn't it? So. Mm. Mm. so she was she's a whippers, so she's really fast, and I just yeah had no chance of catching. Her. <laughs> and she basically she at the end she surrendered herself. She just um, Turned up at the door at the door club. Probably because you got hungry and lonely and a little bit tired, yeah. I would imagine, after Quite all that. Possibly. It was yeah. pretty cold as well that night. But um, yeah, so anyway, we, um, we got there. We got there. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh...
Let's have a look. Okay, no more questions. Quite a lot of messages coming through saying thank you very much. Very interesting discussion. Um, excellent you. to get a refresh on tender management. Um, anybody else that's still listening, um, if you've missed any parts of the webinar or if the sound cut out for any reason, um, you can go onto the LBG website later on and it will be uploaded onto there and you'll also all get an email as well so you can rewatch this later. Yeah. Uh, Peter, I think we'll let you get off to, to bed or spend some time with your family. So that has been great. Um, yeah, no worries. Uh, thanks a lot, Hardy. Thanks a lot. Nice thanks for the invite. And uh, yeah, thanks to everyone for listening. And if they've got qu if they've got other questions, feel free to email. That's no problem. Excellent. Yeah. Okay, Peter. Well, I'll let you log off because I think you're in control of this thing, aren't you? Uh, uh, yes. I think I can press the, press the big red button at the top. Yes. Yes. All right. Thanks a lot. See you later. Okay. Cheers, Peter. Bye. Thanks. Bye.